the session is actually geared as a kind of refresher for people who have been using my learning, but more importantly for people who may never have done anything in the course shell to give them a sense of what your shell should look like and how you could go about starting to work in that shell. So as I told the group before, um, it's more like a show and tell. So it's not a workshop, it's a webinar and we're going to take you through the processes in a show and tell kind of fashion. What we are asking you to do is if you have a course shell and you know how to log into your course, and you're comfortable doing that while I speak and Justin speaks, you can follow along using a course shell as well. So, so that's the approach we're taking. Okay, and um, we do have points in the session where we'll pause and, and allow you to ask us any questions. So let me get started. So the objective for the session today, just to let you all know, we're hoping that by the end of the session, um, you will be able to access your course shell if you haven't done so yet. At least you'll have a sense of how to do it. Um, and that when you go to that course shell, you will also have a sense of how to add a welcome message, um, post any instructions in that course in the form of a file, uh, this, you know, create a discussion forum for your students because the course comes with one, but you should be able to, to post to create one where your students could communicate with you. And of course, the one that most people are interested in is your setting up your assignments, which will be required for the final exam, because we are using my e-learning for you to post your quote unquote final exam, right? And so to start, we're going to just give you all a quick poll. Um, and so it's there on the, on your screen and you should see, yes, I see people have started already. If you could access your course in my learning. And it's going and it's going. See some no responses, come on. Can you access your course in my learning? Mm -hmm. Anthony, Camille, you haven't posted anything. Heather, Indira, Jerome. Can you access your course in my learning? All right, so those of you who are putting no, if you could just put quickly in the chat for me um, some reasons why you, you are not able to access your course, just quickly. So I'll have a sense of what's happening because it's seven people who have indicated they have not, they cannot access their course. So if you could quickly, of those seven people, and I'm, I'm hoping that the 11 no responses are people who just haven't gotten around to posting a response yet. But of the seven people, now the chat is at the bottom. Okay, you could access my learning, but not your course shell. All right. So even you will need to get your enrollment key, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a while. Um, anybody else? I'm I'm here, um, Diane. Um, Jimmy is here. Yes. Yeah. Teach you teach students enrolled in outer courses. Um, so you don't have my e-learning. Special arrangements are to be made for um, for those classes like the ones in CLL that do not, where we don't have um, registered UE students registered in Banner. There are arrangements to be made, so you need to talk to your head of department with regard to those courses. What we're dealing with here are for the persons who the students are registered in Banner and the course is there in banner so it will automatically be in my e-learning you simply have to get access to that shell by being a teacher on the course having your ue id having a ue um, email account and you will send 
a request to Campus IT for you to get an enrollment key so that you can have access to that course. Now, um, because we have a few people who do not have access to the course, I'm just going to go over quickly how they can access the course in my learning. So there's three people who are saying that um, they can't access, and those three people, more than likely, you need to get your enrollment key for the course. So how do you get that enrollment key? For those of you who have the poll on your screen and you don't know how to take it up, just click the X on the top right side. Okay, now the other thing I want to tell you is on the left side of the screen, you should see something looking like a magnifying glass. Please click that so that you can, if because the slides will appear, the writing on the slides might be very tiny on your screen. You have to click that, um, that, that magnifying glass and click the zoom plus sign on the magnifying glass to have it a little bigger so you can see some of what's on the on the slide okay and you'll also be sent these slides at the end of the session along with a list of links where you can get individual um, video clips that will take you through the processes that we talk about in the session so don't worry too much. We, you will have access to those things, self-instructional videos that will take you through um, how to do those things. Um, and if you are a TA, you need to get the first the, the lecturer, the course lecturer, the teacher for the course to um, request your enrollment key. There are enrollment keys for TAs as well, different levels of access, and those can be um, gotten through uh, the same kind of process. All right. So if you look at the screen I have up there, for those of you who need to get your enrollment key, one of the quickest ways which I'm suggesting is if you do a search, just a simple search in your browser for my learning what comes up the first hit you get is to this site campus it services and i'm going to just use the pointer so campus it services it is a site that looks like this it will be the first link that comes up and there is a table and that table allows you to click for click what's called service catalog when you click service catalog you then get a form which allows you to request the enrollment key. And as I said, you need to have your UWE email account. And Justin is also posting a, an email link in the chat that will take you directly to where you could get that form to access the enrollment key. We will also send you a brochure in that list of links that will describe the steps for you to get your enrollment key. It's a brochure and it will be on the, the list of links that we send to you. So don't worry too much, you'll get it by the end of the session. All right? Once you get that enrollment key and you have your username, which is your, your ID and your password, you can then log in. I know some of you said you could log in, but you can't access the course. So when you log in, if you've got your enrollment key and you log in, the view you will get will allow you to see what's called the course overview. I've split the view up into three parts just for ease of explanation. But you may either see three parts or you may see two parts when you log in. You log in and the first thing you see is what's called your dashboard in my learning. And that dashboard has the course overview which will give you um, the set of courses that you can see not necessarily that you could log into but set of courses that you could see your courses that's in the course overview and then there's a part on the side where you will see user support that allows you to click to access various um, self-instructional materials and guidelines on the side now when you scroll down either on the right side of your screen or on the bottom of screen you will see a link that allows you to search for courses. When you click that link, 
you could put in, if you've requested an enrollment key, they will give you a short name for the course, which is what you put in to, to get to your course. Or for those of you who already have your enrollment key and you just want to find your course because it's a whole lot of stuff you're seeing on that dashboard page, you can type in your course code and your course will come up. The link to your course will come up. You could click on it and you will enter your course. Everybody with me so far? Yes? Yes. Yes. Great. Yes. Okay. okay, good. So we move from the dashboard. Once you search, you find your course, you click on it. If you have never used your course shell at all, when it opens up, you will see the title of your course and the code just like this. You will see your name on the top um, on a pull-down menu. And you will see these links just below the title of your course, dashboard of courses, the year, and so on and so on. And these links here allow you to navigate from your course, which would be the one with the course code, to back to the dashboard. We suggest you use these links. We call them the breadcrumbs. Those of you who know the story of Hansel and Gretel, um, they threw breadcrumbs in the forest to try to get back home. And so the breadcrumbs take you back to that home page rather than you having to use your back navigation all the time. So the top of the screen is your course code and title and so on, and then you have your dashboard. And then the middle part is where you would usually put your content and so for the course. And what you get when you get a shell is a link to a news forum. It's either called news forum or announcements. That is like your notice board for the course. It's one way. You can put messages in there for your students, but they cannot reply to you. The course comes with this news forum. All right. And if you put messages in there, it goes, either the students will have to click on the link to see the message, or the message will go to their UE email account. So if they don't check their UE email account, they're not going to see it. And then you have these empty blocks to include topics. Some courses have them, and some courses at some point come, may come without the topics. So I'll show you, if you get a course shell by chance, that only has this top block and it doesn't have the topics, I'll show you how you add the topics in a while. But what I want to draw your attention to right now is when you get that course shell, one of the first things to familiarize yourself with is this wheel, gear wheel, at the top just below your name and so, next to the title of the course, is a, it provides a menu for you to do various things in that course. So that's a very important thing for you to pay attention to. So this gear wheel, when you click the, the down pointed arrow, a menu drops down. And I want to draw your attention in particular to this link, turn editing on, because that's the link that you will need to do everything that you need to do in this course shell to to what we call populate it, to build it, to add things to it. So remember the gear wheel next to the title of the course and turn editing on. You need to do that to do anything in the course, and we'll come back to that. So this is what your shell will look like for those of you who never used it. And you see why we call it a shell. There's nothing in it. So what do you need to have in the My Learning Course Shell? And this is just in terms of the guidelines that we have been provided with to share with you to let you know the startup course shells, what um, the idea is for you to try. Even though it is just, it is meant at this point, we're doing emergency remote teaching, and we really want to gear you up to be able to put in the um, boxes to allow for the exams. We do want the sites to still have a bit of a more human feel, as if, you know, you, you're welcoming the students and you really providing a space for them, even though some of you, it's really just based on the need to have that exam in there. We still would like if you could create some kind of feel in there. So we're asking that you create a brief course welcome that 
um, we want to show you how to upload files because you will need to put up files either to tell the students where to find what or even the instructions for their exams or various things like that you would need to be able to put a file in so we're just going to share that um, you may need to communicate with your students they may want to ask questions about the exam or about the process or you know just to, to communicate and so we're going to show you how to create a discussion forum in my learning so that you don't have to be using email for everything and then the final thing we'll do is share how to create what we call assignment drop boxes because that is what you'll be using for the quote unquote final exam assignment drop boxes and there are two types we will deal with and we will get into that later on pause a bit any questions so far are you all still with me yes 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 yes, yes. great yes. Yes. okay and as I said, for those of you who could log into your course, if you want to, you could log in and just kind of follow along, look for what some of the things we're pointing out so that you have a sense of um, where things are. And so the first thing I wanted to show quickly is if you get a course, and as I said, remember, if you came in late, and I said it earlier, there is a Zoom control on the left side of your screen. You click, it looks like a magnifying glass. You click it. And click the zoom so that you could see the slides a bit better and you will get the slides at the end um, if you get a course shell that just has this one block saying announcements right um, it will have it will allow you to, to add topics and you will be able to do that by clicking I have a red arrow here on the bottom of that screen you will see something that says add topics it's very straightforward and when you click the add topics a pop-up box comes up and it you can put in the number of topics you want now the idea with these topics if you get the shell and they're there right it's intended really for you to build your course in my learning now some people would have done it already and have it there they have that in their course others may not at this point in time you can decide whether you're going to be doing it now or not I know time is limited and you already just focus on exams but I'm still sharing this with you so that if later on new normal you want to build your online course you have a sense of why this system is set up the way it is this is to allow you to you have designed a course and your course outline is divided into most people unless you're med sci a 13 week course and so the topics that you have here generally generally represent the weeks of that course or the topics in the course and so you can use the structure of my e-learning to um, present or to create to design your course along the lines that you would have done in your course outline so technically for each of these topics you could have had a section as you have as you have in your course outline and as you would be doing with your students week by week so that's why they have the topics um, design if you're not going to be using it you can easily hide the topics so that the students only see what you want them to see all right so I just thought I'd share that with you all so we will be focusing though on just the first block for today and people could later on go and determine if they want to use the other sections in their course shells if they have not done so already okay so we're going to start with editing your course and the first thing we want to do is for you to as we said turn editing on in your course anybody's um, following along for yes, now I'm with the Guys, right yeah. great do you is your course um populated or is it a blank shell populated mine okay great all right okay mina yours populated as well so at some point i may ask has 
any one of you, has anybody in the group today, do you have a Turnitin um, assignment up? Do you have a Turnitin assignment already in your course or no? Anybody who has one already, just show of hand. Nobody. Um, any of you, do you have an assignment up already? Oh, Nalini, is that a Turnitin assignment or is it a... Yes, Mina, you have one, and Nalini, do you have one too? Um, a few of you have. So at some point, I may ask somebody to volunteer to share their Turnitin assignment. Um, do you have students in it? Does anybody have it with, I mean, student submissions in it? Because it's very useful if the other persons who don't have a Turnitin assignment can see what it, the assignment looks like with um, actual students in it. Great. So once you add your topics to the course, right, and as I said, the next thing you'd want to do is to create that course welcome. Because remember at the beginning we said we, we want to make it a little welcoming so that when the students go in, they don't just see a shell with two assignments in it. Um, and so, and it doesn't have to be anything elaborate for your course welcome. So to create that course welcome, you're in your shell, right? And you have your announcements there. You're in this first block of the course. Yes. So you're in the block of the course and you click on edit and you should see edit section. That's the only thing that will come up edit section and you will see this as a familiar box that you're going to see over and over again in my learning for those of you who never use it those of you who use it i'm sure you're very familiar with this um a box will usually come up that will ask you to put in a title and a summary now once you see an extra red exclamation point we're not seeing any here it means that that information must be filled in okay now for this general summary to create that course welcome you can put like a subheading in this section that's called general but to do that you have to click on custom when you click on custom check custom box it will allow you to type something in here so you could type something of choice welcome hello students um, good good to see you something right and in this box here this is where you're going to type your welcome text if you just want to give a little description of the course if you want to see something warm and fuzzy it's up to you the arrow here is pointing to a downward pointing arrow my red arrow is pointing to a downward pointing arrow that downward pointing arrow allows you to expand your editing options for this block and you will see in the next slide what it looks like when you expand the editing options right Right now, you see just one line of editing tools you're seeing, just like in Word, um, you know, so you could put bullets and underline and bowl and so on. When you click this downward arrow, it gives a, a larger menu of items. So you're going to click custom, put in a title, welcome to the course, whatever you want to put. And you're going to use the editing tools. You see, I've put in, in red on the slide the instructions. So you're going to use the editing tools to format your text and if you want to add images. Now to add an image, you're going to click when you open up the menu, this icon here that looks like the like a mountain with a little sun or a moon or something. Um, you click there and that will allow you to insert an image in this um, space but you don't have to do all that that's just if you want to do a little something extra you could just type in your text and when you're finished you scroll to the bottom of the screen and it says they give you two options it says either save um, and display or save and go back but it's just remember to save at the bottom of your screen and once you save it this is what your page will look like. This is the text here. 
and I uploaded an image so the image appears there right and then you can go back and click edit if you want to edit it again if you want to edit the title you click the little pencil and that's the welcome right any questions on that for those who would have never used it before do you think it is simply enough for you to go on and do that of course we have the self instruction on the we provide so you can work along with it if you feel that it might be a problem so that's how you add your welcome you can put multiple images yes but then you don't want to clutter the page too much but yes you could put multiple images but you'll have to kind of format it drag it move it around and so on um, it's something you could play around with okay so you have a welcome now and the next thing you want to do is upload some instructions for your students some guidelines something a file a document that tells them where they need to go next right so remember we still on that front page now and the next thing you do is remember people remember what you have to what you have to do if you want to edit anything on your page somebody who's done it before anything you want to do in my learning was the first thing you have to do on your page is it this is your quiz Editing on. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Right. So you turn editing on. You go to the little wheel thing that we showed you earlier. And how you all know when editing is on? How you know when you have editing on in your course? Anybody? How you know? What's the difference in the page? Give you editing the option. Like if you add or remove right so you see it gives you editing option and the link to pencil you see all kinds of icons all over so you see you have a cross here you have a pencil here it says edit here it says add an activity or resource so that's how you know you in the editing mode because you turn everything on so you know that so if you're not seeing anything you can't do anything because then you have to go to an editing mode so when you want to now add your instructions or resource to the course you need to click this link in the section that you want to add it to um, are you all hearing me i know some people are saying that they're not hearing me well right okay yes. right good i just adjusted my microphone a bit right so you click add an activity or resource now this link is going to be very familiar to you because this is what you need to click every time you're going to add something so you click add an activity or resource and you once you click that uh let me just check people here and some static let me see what this is okay all right once you click add an activity or resource you will get a page like this now this page this is just a snapshot of the page you see the page is divided into activities and resources now we want to add a file so we go to resources and we double click in this little dial here next to file or if you just select it click once and then you click add so either double click there and it goes straight to the next page or you click add and the next page you get is this all right this is i've divided it in two parts because i couldn't get it all down in a snapshot and, and again i'll tell you zoom in if you can't see too well right you get a form and you need to start to fill in that form you see what i was telling you all about earlier with the um, explanation the red explanation that tells you are you all hearing me? Terry Mohammed is not hearing anything. Are you all hearing yeah, me? I'm okay. hearing. All right. So it's Terry. It's Terry down system. Okay. So you fill in this form, and you have to fill in once you see the red 
um, explanation mark, you must put that in. And then there's a, an area for you to just fill in um, a description. Uh, you could choose either for that description of what you have to go on the page for the student to see, or you could just leave it for your purposes. It's up to you. And then there is a section now that allows you to upload the file that you want your students to see. You upload that file, you can do it in two ways. Either you drag the file and drop it in this area here where you see this downward arrow that says you can drag your file here. Or you click on this little icon here, when you have over it, it will say uh, what it is. You click there and that allows you to this this one here. And that allows you to then You get to a page where you can then browse. It's like email. Think of the email, all right? Um, you browse here. You find the file on your computer or your flash drive or whatever. And when you click that, the file you'll see the file appearing. The name for the file appearing next to the browse button. You need to give it an, a name to save it in the filing system. And then you click upload this file. Once you click that upload this file, you then go back to the original page, the form that you had. But you now see the file saved there in that box where you had the arrow pointing saying drag and drop the file. And you see you could tell what kind of file it is. This is a Word document I uploaded. And you could continue filling in the form. The form asks you things like if you want the, thing, the file to pop up in a box or if you just leave it. You could just leave the default option if you choose, um, if that's the easiest way. And if not, if you want something else, you could click on the little question mark next to each thing and it will explain to you what the options are. So you don't need to go anywhere for that help. You can find it right there in the little question mark that's next to each thing. You then have two options, either save and return to course, right? Or you can either save and return to course or save and display. We always like to choose save and return to course because it allows you to see what you've done, what it looks like on the course page. So I'm just going to go back and this is what the, this is the file that I uploaded and this is what it looks like on the course page. You see, you see, it's a word. Everything has, all the links have the little icons. This is an icon for discussion. This is an icon saying this is a word file here. And if you made a mistake and you uploaded a wrong file or you, you put a name here, you can click it so you see what the file is, and then you can go here to edit and change things again. Questions on that? Anybody? It's very straightforward, right? Correct? Right, it's straightforward. And I know most of you, many of you, I know the name from Cuttle, would have done all of this before. And you probably just want a little refresher, see if there's anything new or different. My learning is my learning. It might just be a different solution, but processes remain the same. And as I said, we have we giving you all the links so that you can go back and do a quick. And they have videos, so you just play the videos and go back over. All right. So the last thing I will show you before Justin takes over and does the assignments uh, is the discussion forum. How do you create a discussion forum? I'm just going to show you one because it's the same process for any kind of forum that you want to create. The settings will determine the difference. But the process itself of adding a discussion forum is the same. And a discussion forum is simply a, a communication tool that allows you to, to post questions and you, or comments and your students can reply. Or they can ask you questions and you can reply. So it's a good communication tool. Not real time, 
it's there and it sits there, so you have to establish your protocol for how you're going to use your forum, right? So how do you create this forum? Again, just like we for the resource, remember on your first page, you will scroll, turn editing on, and you add an activity or resource. Just like with the file, just like you're going to do with the assignment, this is the link to add anything. Add an activity or resource. Once you click add an activity or resource, remember the same page that came up, but this time you're looking at activities. All right, and Justin will talk about assignments in a while. You see assignments is at the top of the list, A. We are going to, and this is the thing with the discussion forum. It's not called discussion forum in my learning, it's called forum. But you know it by this icon, all right? So it's in activities, it's F, so it's down here, and it's forum. You double click on it, or you click in the circle and then click add. And again, guess what? Just like with the resource, you have a form to fill in. Same first part is the same, where you put in a name, and again, the red explanation. So you have to put a name for your forum. Is it, what is your question? Is it questions on exam? Is it ask me anything? Whatever. You choose a name for your discussion forum, and you could put a description to let your students know what this discussion forum is for. Then you have to go on to the rest of the form. It will ask you the type. The default that we have is a standard forum for general use, which we suggest you leave it as unless you're doing some kind of discussion um, for learning, teaching, and learning purposes. If it's just for simple for communication, you just use the standard forum for general use, which is the default forum. So you don't have to touch it. And in fact, you don't need to touch anything else uh, if you're just having communication, other than perhaps subscription and tracking, if you uh, if you want to force your students to be subscribed, meaning you want to be sure that whatever you put in the forum goes straight to the email and they can't block it. All right. So the next step then is to ensure you check your settings. So you have the correct type of forum, you want a standard forum, and you want the appropriate subscriptions. If you want it optional, meaning they can decide they're turning it off, they don't want to see when discussions coming in and all that. Or for subscription, where they have to know when a discussion forum is coming. So you choose that, and then you click save and return to course. Just like with the others, just like you did with the resource page, just like you did with the welcome page. And then we go back to see what the course page looks like. So now we put in our welcome page, our welcome message, sorry. And we put in a file called Course Navigation Guidelines. And we put in a discussion forum. I have a question. All right? So questions or so fast so good? Right, everybody following so far. Okay, so I will hand over then to Justin. Are you there with us still? Yes, I'm here. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Justin Zafrin, who is now going to take us through the, uh, the assignment part, the assignment Dropbox part. So over to you, Justin. All right. Thanks so much, Diane. Um, so guys, uh, a lot of the the, 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 the the main thing about exams, of course, you would have probably heard some sort of correspondence from the exam section and whatnot in, in terms of the direction the university is taking. And in addition to what Diane um, just referred to with regard to um, inserting a welcome note and a discussion forum um, and whatnot in your course, in my learning course shell, um, you're now going to create the, 
Dropbox, the submission box, where students will submit their assignments so you can subsequently assess. All right. So the first step is really, as well, I guess you guys could tell me, what is the first thing you're going to do when you would like to do anything in your course? Diane referred to it earlier. Anybody? You do the edit. Right. You turn editing on. All right. Let me just get the pointer up. Good. Thanks, Marlon. All right. You turn editing on. Right. And of course, you know, there's a little gear button on the right, top right side. Um, and then you click add an activity or resource right by this arrow here. Add an activity or resource. Once, now the thing with my learning, it's very intuitive. And even though you might be doing different activities or different things in it, the interface looks almost the same. All right, which makes it easier to use, very user friendly. So you're going to see this button here, add a resource, add an activity or resource. And then once you click on that, it'll take you on this left side, this right side here. This pop up window is going to appear where you can add an activity or resource, where it's going to ask you basically um, prompt you to select what activity you're trying to add or you'd like to add. In this case, now remember you would have done um, selected uh forums earlier all right in this case you're going to set the top here the first one it's in alphabetical order you're going to select um add an assignment all right you could double click assignment all right double click assignment that will take you to this page um more so on the left side um the adding an active adding an assignment activity page would appear um at this point, you're going to insert a title. So, for example, final assessment, final course assessment. Um, I don't know if you want to say exam because exam sort of, um, there's a certain connotation of that that it's like a face to face exam, right? So, you want to probably put final assessment, final course assessment, something of that nature. Um, so, the student can clearly identify um, the, the assignment stands out. All right, because the last thing you want is for the student to be, especially if your course has a lot of material in it already, the last thing you want is to be click for the student to be scrolling through to find out where to submit this thing. So you put the assignment title, and right under that, you're going to put the description. Now, the description in my learning is another word for a prompt or the instructions for your assignment. So let's say, for example, you'd like, you have um, an essay question. Um, you'd like students to add to, 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 to write an essay of 5,000 words and so on. Um, this is where, and of course, let's say APA formatting, MLA formatting. This is all where you're going to state that, the instructions. Now, let me just say right off the bat that the assignment activity is different from the Turnitin um, assignment activity because uh, well, one of the main things is that Turnitin really is a detection, a plagiarism detection software. The, my, the regular my learning assignment um, would recognize anything, but there's a there's a there are pros and cons with that, right? The my learning assignment because it will recognize just about anything. Um, if you have assignments that are uh, that comprise of not just text but also images, graphs, um, videos, and so on, then Turnitin will have a hard time recognizing it. It, it wouldn't be very comfortable with Turnitin because Turnitin will only recognize text. So if your assignment is something like an essay, then by all means you can use Turnitin. However, if it's something like, um, let's say for example in engineering or medicine um, or even mathematics, they might have um, a finite way of solving an equation or graphs and diagrams and so on, then you probably want to use the math learning assignment as we see in here. All right. Any questions on that before we move on? Yes, I have a question. Sure. Um, so this is the, the, when they said access, it's really for student access. Yeah, well, you are just creating a platform where students will submit their assignments. Okay. But you're not you. you're not gonna be you're not gonna be grading in this um thing because remember it's like an exam, so you can't put like the final assignment, the final grade and so on there. 
So it's really the, the it's almost like if you know how students will come and submit to your office, like a hard copy, then this is kind of the same, but in a virtual way. All right, and Turnitin is where you put, yes, yes. Turnitin is really for essays and text-based, um, even short answer um, assignments. And you, the normal my learning assignment will cater to any format or any sort of um, a wider content. Let me put it like that. Right? It would, it would, it would recognize you. Just to interrupt Justin quickly. Sure. Um, to let people know that those persons who will not be using the Turnitin assignment drop off should know already because they would have been given special permission to not use Turnitin. Everybody else is supposed to use Turnitin unless text, and in which case they would have had to get permission from the heads of departments and all that beforehand. Yes. It was just a, yes. to bring that to people's attention. And I see Rada has a question for you. Yes. Go right Hi, Dr. Johnson. Yes. I'm there. just asking the difference between uh, similarity and plagiarism because, you know, if you are in medicine now and you have certain names of muscles and so on, right? For sure, mm -hmm. you'll find the same name already done in the assignment. So in this case, uh -huh. it will be similarity or plagiarism. Well, let me explain both. The, the, the similarity index is basically the, the report that, that Turnitin will produce for you that will illustrate the potential plagiarism in the, in the document. All right, it doesn't mean that, and then of course you would now have to go through and see what that similarity index is um, highlighting or, or, or picking up or indicating. All right, mm -hmm. um, and yeah, so that's that, that, does that answer your question? Yeah, I see, the, but if it is, yeah, what I'm saying, it is a uh, certain thing in medicine, you will have to repeat name of muscles, name of nerve, you know, uh, yeah, be repeated, you understand? So, not everything yeah. marked in internet and means it pleasure is exactly, exactly. Yeah, it's, it's called a similarity, not pleasure, right? Exactly, right? So, you will have to go through that. Or when I say you, not necessarily you specifically, but I mean whoever's in charge of the marking and so on, you just yes. have to keep that in mind. You have to go through and see what the similarity index is and verify whether you assess it as a plagiar an, an act of plagiarism or not. Um, yes. And keep in mind that when you're doing things like mathematics or even in any medical sciences, um, where there, like I said earlier, a finite set of answers. So for example, if you give me an equation, right, in mathematics, there's only one way or possibly maybe two, if, if depending on how, you know, it is, that that equation or that problem can be solved. So I don't know if you want to put it through Turnitin because then you're going to have the entire class plagiarizing, each plagiarizing themselves, right? So keep those things, those intricacies in mind. Um, I think I want to chart students post answers on Turnitin as well. Right. Good question. Students can post answers um, in Turnitin. And I'll come to you just in, in just a minute, Heather. Um, Right, so they, they, they can post and turn it in as well, yes, to answer your question. Um, they can post, and I would recommend that you use more, you encourage them to post documents as opposed to type in responses in the interface for various reasons. One being that the interface times out after a certain um, period of inactivity, so you don't want that, and then a, a host of other technical issues. So, but to answer your question, both turn it in and the regular my learning assignment allows for student submission. I think Heather had a hand up. Yeah, I did. Um, afternoon, everybody. My question is one about um, language, because in the case of a foreign language, what a lot of students do sometimes if you give them take home assignments is that they, they type out um, what they want to type out in English and then they will put it into something like Google Translate, um, right. and then it spits back out the, the you know, French, Spanish, Portuguese, yeah. whatever version of it. Um, my question to you would be, in the case of Turnitin, if I am to give them an assignment um, and they find um, a script that is in English that speaks to the assignment, but then put it into a Google Translate or whatever else, and it, they get um, the Portuguese or the French or the Spanish version 
um, does turn it in, is turn it in capable of recognizing plagiarism in another language? Yes, as far as I'm aware, yes. I don't know if Diane could chime in, but um, Turnitin will recognize what plagiarism. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh. What Turnitin does is it matches against scripts, yeah. articles, documents, and so on that exist in the repository that Turnitin um, searches in. So Turnitin will search in repositories on the internet. And once something is in that repository and it can match it against that, that is where you get the matching. So unless the thing is there, it can't match it. You understand? So okay, it's really but if the matching thing, it's not it's not it's not that Turnitin has something in it that detects if somebody stole something. It all it does is it's matching it up against existing files in various repositories. It searches and it matches it against something that exists somewhere else. So if you wrote an article and it's in the Turnitin repository, it's gone to the Turnitin repository, and somebody else copies that, and you put it into Turnitin, it will come up as a match. But if it was never right. in the repository, then there can't be a matching. And but the repository true. will only have it in one language. If I have, if I have, um, if there's a, a case study that is done in English, and the student takes that case study that is done in English and they, they translate it into Portuguese and then submit the Portuguese version, it means that the Turnitin repository will only have the English version, not the Portuguese, so they will get away with plagiarism. Not necessarily. They may have the, if somebody else posted the Portuguese version, the Portuguese version will be there. So it's not, Turnitin is not only English. But right, okay. know, it depends, but it matches the, 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 uh, the thing though is that the document itself, the, the document must exist for the matching to take place. Right, and and I got you. And I think when we go into the Turnitin Act assignment, you'll see the different categories or things that you could get Turnitin to, to match with, whether it's publications, whether it's websites, whether it's other student essays in the past and so on. So you could, you could, even if it's in Portuguese, you could still get that match there as well, right? Okay. Um, I was, I was gonna say that also Turnitin would match um, uh, combinations of words, yeah. Even it might be, even though it might be in a different language, and that's kind of what we were referring to when when we were talking about the similarity index. It will match certain phrases, certain words, certain sentences that would be. Um, if they're very similar, or partly similar, it will pick it up as well. Um, let me okay. look at the chat. I'm just looking at the chat. Yeah, I'm sorry. Okay, thanks so much, Diane. Yeah. Yeah, All right, no let's move on to the rest of the, the, the assignment, and then we'll get into the Turnitin assignment. Uh, All right, so Justin, continue. Excuse, excuse me. My, yes. Justin, excuse me. Uh -huh. Before you move on to the other part, I, I posted a question. Um, in terms of law, where students are able to quote directly from treaties and international agreements and so on, would that come up as plagiarism mm -hmm. under Turnitin? Um, if they source it, it would not um, turn it. It wouldn't. It wouldn't be identified as a plagiarized piece of text. Um, because and when you, again, when you go into Turnitin, you could um, set Turnitin to ignore phrases and quotation marks, for example. Yeah, um, and things like that. So if it is that they are quoting from a treaty, and of course that quote is in Britain, in Britain, Britain commas and so on, then um, you can ask it, you could program the study system to ignore that. All right? Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you very, thank you very much. Okay, great, no problem. All right, so very quickly, um, we have here the, so once you insert your assignment um, instructions, uh, you're going to, if not in some cases, you might have um, a document, um, such as a case study, to go along with your assignment instructions. In which case, this little, on the right side here, you're going to click on this little arrow, this little, sorry, folder icon or, or file icon, all right? 
and then just upload your document. All right. And not every time you're going to have an attachment. Sometimes you might have everything in this side with the instructions and the students just have to go and get the information themselves. But in some cases, you might have uh, an attachment with further instructions, whether it be about formatting, um, whether it be um, case studies and so on that would help them, or further instructions that would help them complete the assignment. All right. Um, so once you click on that, file icon it's going to take you to a window like this um and you're gonna it's just like if you're not, you're attaching a, a a document or an email right you're going to see browse you click on browse you're going to search or locate your assignment right when you click open it'll appear here so in this case test blueprint that's if that's the name of the document right after that you click upload this file all right, upload this file. Let me just back up a bit that it's on, notice on the left side, upload a file is on the left side, right? So this means that you wanna make sure you want, it's an upload a file and then click browse and that you can, that's how you're gonna get browse on the other things on this side. Um, the, the, let me just say, I think Greg typed a question. I think Greg typed a question. Uh, I'm on my course, but small match option. Go ahead, I would deal okay. with, with Greg's question. Okay, Can thanks. Go ahead. All right, so let's continue, guys. So once you set the instructions or the prompt for your assignment, then the next thing you're going to do is set the time frame um, within which students need to can submit and when they need to submit by. Now there's a, a couple of things I want to address here. Um, let me just, now feel free to magnify the, the slide if it is it's a little small for you, the text. So this allow submissions from, is really when you're gonna, when students will be able to submit their assignments, all right? In most cases, I think it's from the 25th of May, correct? Yeah? It's from the 25th of May. All right. So, Good. So by default, I guess you're going to have to just put 40, the 25th of May. All right. After that, um, you're going to put the month. Well, of course, it's May. And the year. Right. The date is always, well, in my learning, it's the day, the month, the year. After that, you're going to see the, the hours. The hour is a 24-hour clock. So you're going to see something like, for example, what we see here, 22 past, 22 hours or... 23 hours, that kind of thing. If it's a full um, day, like you wanted to give, to, to, you want to set the deadline from midnight, then you're going to click 23 as the hour, because that'll be like 11 um, or 12, I think. Yeah. And then the minute would be 59. All right. So that's the allow submissions from. Um, couple windows or menu here. After that, right under that, you have the due date. Now the due date is the, 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 the deadline that you want to set for students. Now remember, according to BOSS, you have to give students between two to seven days, I believe, to submit the assignment. So let's say if it's from the 25th of May and you want to give it to the 31st of May, for example, or even a couple days before that. Um, this is when you, the due date is when you're going to set, where you're going to set those parameters. So in this case, it might be the 31st of May, right? So you have the 31st May 2020, and I guess the time could be 23.59, right? Which would be 11.59 in their, in their language, I believe. Now, the cutoff date, you want to make sure this is disabled. Make sure this is grayed out, the cutoff date. Right, the cutoff date, according to the disabilities unit, and you want to be able to cater to, to the differently able. So, by not setting a cutoff date, um, you allow persons who have um, who are differently able to the extra leeway or the time that they need to submit. 
Now, already the concern here might be, um, what about students who don't, um, who are not on the list of um, disabled students, but submit late? Yes, they can submit late, but the system will identify it as late. All right, it'll be marked off as, um, as red, right? I think, I think Greg is posting something, <clears throat> right? Yes, yes, Greg, they did, right? Example, midnight and the Judith. Very good. That's that's exactly what I was saying. So um, you want to keep that in mind. I'm not sure if it came specifically from bus. I was just given an example, um, but we might need to verify that. Um, and I would intervene. recommend actually. Yeah. yeah, Justin, just to intervene. Exam section, they will be doing a timetable, and so they will be indicating. Um, how that timing thing is to go. But what Justin is yeah. referring to is um, the issue of blocking, blocking the students from submitting. That's what he's going to talk about. But yeah. the exact times that you're going to set exam section in their guidelines, they will indicate. Because I think there's some clarification to be done with that. Yes, yes. So to recap the debates, the differences amongst the three different dates you're seeing here. The allow date is really that time from which students can submit. The due date is the deadline by which <laughs> students must submit. The cutoff date is what you'll even grade out. Make sure you you the box next to it is is not ticked. Do not tick this box or make sure there's no tick in this box. All right, and that's how you know it's disabled. It'll be grayed out. And the cutoff date, the reason you don't want to set the cutoff date again is because you still want students to be able to submit. All right, remember, if you have students with different, um, uh, with, with, with disabilities, usually you're going to have a list, correct? They provide you with a list of um, the students who may be differently able in your, in your class. From that list, you're going to be able to identify out of the students who submitted late, you're going to be able to identify who are the persons on that list, right? Um, and from there, you can make the necessary, um, take the necessary action. If, for example, a student is not on that list, then, you know, there might be some sort of penalty for late submission. It'll be genuinely late as opposed to other circumstances. All right? I think we have a little chat about the, in the in, a little uh, thing in the chat about the exam date and time and so on. Right. So, who will select the date of exam for any course? I think that would be something that the exam section will have to 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 chime in on. Right. You might need to. They might shed some light on that. Um, what is bus's policy on late submissions? I think with that, um, I'm not sure what the specific policy is under these circumstances. I know so in some cases, there's a 10% um, penalty um, for late submissions. I think every day for like about three days, and then after that, you can't submit. Um, but that's, that has been quite a while ago. So I'm not sure what the current under the current circumstances, what that um, policy might be. So you might need to, to, to seek bus and or exam section with regard to that. All right, Naresh? All the exam regulations will be addressed by exam section in right. their guidelines. They are going to try to, as far as possible, keep as close as possible to the face-to-face, quote-unquote, regulations but um they are going to be providing that so so we're not going to be responding with regard to the those kinds of issues because those are exam regulations that they will provide in the guidelines so all those things to do with the format of the exam the the rules and so on exam section will address that we just want to share with you the tool oh, that is to be used mm -hmm. all right Okay, so to move forward, um, once you set the cutoff date, um, 
everything else could stay as is. You just can't, you finish the, 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 the submit, sorry. You complete the rest of the form, right? And on the right side here, we see some of the, the no problem rummage. On the right side, you see some of the other sections that you need to, to complete, all right? For example, the common module settings makes it available to students, et cetera, et cetera. And then you want to click save and return to course. Always click save and return to course because that way you're able to see where it's located in the course homepage. You're able to, to see what students actually might actually see. All right, what's the title of it? You're able to see from the course homepage what it looks like. All right, when you click save and return to course, it'll take you back to your course homepage. And here we have the assignment we just created. All right. And if you need to go back and edit it, once editing is turned on, and the, remember that's the blue gear button at the top, then you can click here and click edit settings if you need to make a tweak, if you need to, to add something to the instructions, for example, or you want to verify the, um, the, the parameters, the time, the window of opportunity for students to submit and so on. All right. Any questions on that? I go right ahead. Okay, just just now uh, I'm asking a difference between assignment and the take home exam in terms of tenant N. In terms of? Of tenants of tenant N. If if you have like a take home exam. Like if you have like, a, you will upload like a, a certain the question about assignments, yes. And this mm -hmm. case will be have to go for Tenet N for Tenet N also? Yes. Because well, you don't have to answer, to answer question, not to write assignment. Right. In this case, I guess everything kind of con is considered a take-home exam. And what would normally be a take-home exam in other uh, situations is considered um, alternative assessments. Um, in this current circumstance. So um, in this case, whether it's Turnitin or the regular my learning assignment, you're gonna be, the, the process will be the same. You give the instructions to students, whether it be the, you know, an essay question or something that they need to work on and they work on it remotely, mm -hmm. all right? And then come back to my learning and submit it, whether it's in, whether, well, wherever you submit the, wherever you create the assignment submission box, whether it is in, the regular my learning assignment or the Turnitin assignment. Okay, so the lecture now just you have to, to remind just to remind okay. you all that the mandatory Dropbox is the Turnitin Dropbox. Yes. Everybody is supposed to get their students to submit in the Turnitin Dropbox. The only people who are not submitting in the Turnitin Dropbox are people who are submitting graphics and non-text yes. assignments and those would have been approved beforehand so all of you here unless you have gotten approval you're supposed to be using the turnitin dropbox which justin is going to show you now okay. every assignment that's the final exam is supposed to be submitted in a turnitin dropbox and justin is now going to show you all how to create that turnitin dropbox okay just a last question justin please uh in terms of submission, you, have, you must be because data and the and so on? Um, normally when they submit it to Turnitin, it's as, it, 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 it produces it as a PDF. You will see it as a PDF for sure, for sure. All right? This is um, the report, right? You, you will go by, by the report, right? So that yes, means you will, yes. you will see the final, uh, the final report uh, as a, as a as a as a f uh, file after ten ten right right once the yes, okay. produces that report or whatever yeah yes yeah. yes yes okay all right so let's go to ten ten and I guess this will clarify clear up some of the um the points that or concerns that you might have is that okay all right no problem thanks Virginia so. We're going to look now at Turnitin. And right off the bat, you know, it's the same process. So you turn editing on, you click add an activity or resource, and then you're going to scroll down. Now, Turnitin, remember I said earlier, it's in alphabetical order. So you scroll down just a little bit, just midway, as you see where the um, scroll bar is here. And then you're going to see Turnitin. 
double click Anton right here. All right, you double click on Turnitin, and then the adding a new Turnitin assignment page will appear. Notice it's a similar interface or, or format as the regular My Learning assignment, right? So in this case, you're going to, like we said before, you give it a title or name, right? In this final assignment um, or final assessment, and then you give your instructions here, right? And a little bit, a little, coming up to the end of the session, I'll show you how you could modify this a little bit. So just to walk you through the process very quickly. So you insert your instructions here or your prompt. So for example, um, write a, to provide a critical summary of um, X, Y, and Z. Um, your essay is to be no longer than um, three pages um, in APA format, et cetera, et cetera. All right, once you do that, just as we did with the regular My Learning assignment, um, you're going to set some parameters. One of them being the submission type. I usually specify for it to be upload, file upload, right? That's right under the summary box, file upload, right? Number of parts, one, I always recommend one, even if you have a series of short answer essay questions, you could instruct your students to, even though they are short answer um, responses, they can put it in as one document, but just identify the, you know, different segments or sub questions, all right? Um, let me just magnify this a little bit. Uh, the maximum number of um, file size, of course, that could stay as is, which is equal to site limit. All right, allow submissions of any type. So this answers your question. Uh, uh, you know, and then we have the originality report. Display to students. I always click yes. Right, you want students to see the originality report. So they can can see the extent of plagiarism and make the necessary corrections before they submit. And the problem is not so much if they unknowingly uh, plagiarize. The problem is if they submit that um, document knowing that it's plagiarized or has that extent of plagiarism. All right. And when in previous iterations of this workshop, there was a, a sort of I don't want to call it a debate, but a little concern. Because I guess people prefer that <laughs> a level of mystery that the student should not know the extent of plagiarism. But um, you, you you need to let the student see the um, the report. All right, the, the similarity index, the summary. Um, automatically refresh. Yes. Yeah. So if the student resubmits, will sub refresh the um, originality report and. Um, and, and, and produce a new originality report, basically. So as we scroll a little further down, and we'll get to, to other aspects in just a bit, this is where you're going to set the parameters with regard to submission times and so on. So part, under name, you can leave this as part one to touch this, right? The main thing under here, you want to make sure that you set the start date. And just like the my learning assign the regular my learning assignment, you're going to set the date, the month, the year, and then the time. Time in hours and then minutes. You're going to do the same for the due date, which would be the month, the day, the month, the year, the hour, and minutes. All right? The course. Justin, is, sorry, yeah. Justin. Um, as, you get to the, as you get to the originality report options, I just wanted to let you know, Greg had a question there. So when you get to there, if you could just, um, it had to do with the setting the matches. So I'm just putting it out so that you'll remember. Okay, thanks so much, Diane. Okay. All right. Um, so yes, and then of course, the post date, you could ignore the post date for the most part. The post date is really when you're going to be putting grades, posting the grades up in, 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 on the platform and so on. But remember, because we're trying to do this under quote unquote exams, exam conditions, you're not going to be posting the grades, right? So in fact, there's a regulation that stipulates um, that that prevents us from posting final grades and, and, you know, final assessments and so on in my learning. So the main thing of concern here would be the start date and the due dates. All right. When we get to the originality report options, 
this is, I guess, what Greg was referring to earlier. Um, do you allow submissions after the due date? Yes. And for the same reasons I highlighted in my learning assignment, we want to cater to students with um, uh, disabilities and whatnot. And the system highlights, as I said before, The report generation speed. Um, I always click. Oh, are you hearing me? Is everyone we hearing hear me? We hear you now, but we lost your audio for a couple of seconds just now. So I don't know what was said. Oh, okay. Back. Are you you hearing me now, right? Oh, okay. Yes, okay. Great. Yes, yes. So let me just back up. Thanks so much. So let me just back up a little bit. Um, I was saying that the start date and the due dates are the main dates you want to focus on here. The post date is really where you're going to, um, you could ignore this for the most part. This is really where you're going to post grades and the date that you're going to post your grades and so on. But I was saying that under since we're moving under quote unquote exam sec, uh, conditions, you're not going to be posting uh, um, results here, the grades here. Someone said they're not hearing me? Is everyone okay. hearing me? It's okay, yeah, it's okay. Hearing you, it's Eden. Yeah. Eden yeah. is probably okay. having a problem. Okay, sorry. So, yes, um, after that, you're going to, I was talking about the originality report, right? Allow submissions after the due date, yes, to ensure that students with disabilities and so on can also submit. Um, the report generation speed, immediately, make sure it's immediately. So students can, they don't have to wait a whole 24 hours or more to see the original to report. All right. Um, so keep that in mind. All right. Now, let me just put a stick up in here. Um, when students submit more than, I think, three times or four times in one day, three to five times, let's just say it as that, um, they're gonna, then they're going to have to wait um, a couple hours before they submit, uh, before they can submit into Turnitin again. All right, so students need to be mindful of that, that there's a limit to the number of submissions you can make um, to turn it in at one point in time. Right, so the originality report options. I think Greg had some questions here. Um, let me just go through these and let me see if, I, if the questions are answered along the way, right, Greg? Um, as I said, allow submissions after the due date, yes. Report generation speed immediately. Make sure it's immediately. Store student papers in a repository. No. The reason you're doing, you're ensuring that it's no repository, um, is to ensure that students don't end up in this situation where they, where it seems that they plagiarize themselves when they submit um, very early and then realize there's a correction to be made, and then they try, they made the correction and try to resubmit, and then it shows almost 100% plagiarism. Right? Um, so no, make sure you click no repository. And remember we said earlier that the repository is what Turnitin will use to um, create the similarity index between what is out there versus what is what the student is submitting. All right? Now here, you're going to see some of the different options we have. Um, right off the bat, we see um i can't remember who was asking the question about i think it was with the portuguese assignment for example um so we have here the different ways in which you could um identify what Turnitin will check student submission against in this case um do you want to check against student paper so in other words will students um to see similarities between what the student is submitting and what may have been submitted by other students in the past? Yes. Check against the internet sources, such as websites and so on? Yes. In other, um, in other aspects, you're going to see where it allows you to check against publications, journals, etc., etc. Yes. I think someone is asking a question let me just address that besides using my learning platform where else 
would we have to upload these final examination questions? I did not. Oh, we said read. exam section will deal with that in their guidelines. We cannot address that issue. They will provide yeah. that in their guidelines. I had a student who got a notification from her internet provider stating that her area would not have internet for a specified time frame. If a student has that circumstance at the time for submission, what do we do? I think again, examination section would, would, would address that concern. Yeah, how to deal with late submissions and so on. I think someone asked a question earlier about that as well, Heather. So um, exam section would be able to um, yes. shed some light on. If you don't put late submission, you said that you're allowed to submit afterwards. So therefore, I assume that just tell you which to mark and which not, and that would exactly. be important. Exactly. That's exactly it, right? So it's not that they can't submit. It's just what do you do with the late submission, right? Um, with regard to the timeline, I think exam is looking at the exam section is they gave a deadline of the 15th of May to have. Your, your stuff set up in um, my learning and submit whatever documents you need to submit to them. So let's look, at the, I think it's the 15th of May, which is next week, Friday. All right, no problem. So once we click save and return to course, um, it takes us to this, um, well, our course homepage. All right, where we have our final assignment. Let me just scroll down. And we see it here. Now notice the difference between the Turnitin assignment icon, which is down here, and the regular assignment icon. Right, I will say, I think I was showing that a little earlier. I think it's 40 megs. If you, however, you need, you know that you might have, I know in engineering, they tend to have very large assignment submissions. In that case, you might need to contact SIPs. All right. So yes, so yes, no problem, um, Indira. So when we click on this Turnitin assignment now, it will take us to this page. Um, and this is what it looks like. It's very, I don't say basic, but very simple. Um, you're gonna have the parameters that you just set for your assignment. All right, the post date, sorry, the start date, the due date, etc. And then usually right under here, you're gonna have the student submissions. And when you see the student submissions, it's gonna, um, you should see right off the bat, the, um, uh, what you call it, the, the, the extent of plagiarism. It's usually color coded, all right? So for example, I think green is fairly safe, um, but then when you have other, other, other things like red, you really know red is dangerous. So I think red is like 90% and over. Um, in terms of the extent of plagiarism. And I'm just gonna bring up a little, I'm just gonna bring up a little uh, thing here with regard to, remember I said earlier, um, there's a way you could tweak the instructions in your assignment. So in this case, um, I'm gonna show you how to upload a file to your Turnitin assignment. Now, the thing about this, in my learning, we would have done it where we showed you, um, you just click the, the, the upload button, you browse your file, and then you upload this file. Right, so Greg, um, let me come back to that in just a bit. You might see it later on in this, um, in this thing. If not, I'll come back to it. All right, Greg? Um, so yes, so, just remind me in case I forget, okay, Greg? Um, so yes, so let me just scroll. So let's, you you would be familiar with this part, all right, where you stated your, your assignment title, all right? Um, and then after that, you're gonna type in the text that you want to type in, your instructions, your prompt, etc. In some cases, it could be, please click here for further instructions, all right? After that, you're going to highlight it just like you would make a hyperlink in a Word document or an email. You highlight the text that you want to hyperlink. All right. Then you're going to click the first icon, which is right here. First icon in the first row, followed by the third icon in the third row. 
All right. When you click this first icon, no in zero. <laughs> no, you can't use email because exam has to verify different things, right? And they would, of course, um, uh, further specify that um, in a case like that. I, the most I could recommend, of course, this is subject to what exam the exam section says, would be to have some sort of um, drop box. Um, but then again, like I said, that is subject to the recommendations from the exam section. All right, so you click on this first icon, it's gonna expand the menu, you're gonna see all these things. And then when this menu is expanded here, click the third icon in the third row. Once you do that, it's gonna take to something like this. This little window will pop up here where it's asking you to create a link. The first thing you wanna do is make sure you click open in a new window. So it'll, pop, it'll open and when it so clicks on the hyperlink, it'll pop up in a new window. All right, so they wouldn't confuse the two sites. Then you click browse repositories. And this is really browse repositories in this case means that you're gonna locate um, or browse your files, right? You're gonna locate your files. So you'll see browse, and of course we're familiar with, the, with this little interface here. Browse, once you find your exam, your, sorry, your document, you click upload this file. Now, we'll be sending this document to you and at the end of this document, it has a nice little tutorial video that you could use um, in the event, no, this is really in the event um, you wanna attach a document in your Turnitin assignment, attach a document to your Turnitin assignment. All right, because there's a different way you do it here, as like I just showed you, as opposed to my e-learning. All right, so let me just get back to the PowerPoint and to answer Greg's question. Now, Greg, there are different options. Um, you can have with regard to sharing, uh, with regard to tweaking the the settings in Turnitin. I'm hearing somebody's microphone. Is on. It's, it's mine on. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> because what I was going to ask is if someone in the group, and I know people said that they have Turnitin assignments set up with students in it. Um, if we could have let them share that screen, we did. I did that um, on Friday, and people seem to appreciate seeing what it looks like when it's there and the students have submitted. So, if we have somebody who could share a screen, that would be good. But before we do that, to go back to what Greg was asking, which is when I stopped you when you were doing the originality report options. Mm -hmm. Um, and in particular, he said when he tried to exclude small matches, he was seeing the default. But I'm not sure why that is on his system because when you go to originality report options, he's supposed to for exclude small matches. He's supposed to just see a box yeah. when he could put in yeah. a number like ten words or five words or whatever. Right. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. So, but um, the slide itself doesn't have that. So that's why I was hoping. If we have somebody who could share their turn it in assignment screen, well, then we let me probably... see. I think I have a turn it in assignment. Let me just find it. For yeah, you, but okay? yours would not students. No, yours but it'll, it'll just show him the settings. Yeah. All right. So it could show him the settings, and then if we could get somebody with students for people to see what it looks like once the students submit. So while you share yours, let me ask if there's anybody who has one. If they see what it is, then I could always just switch their um, access so that they could look yeah. for it, set it up and all that. So you could go ahead and share and I will look um, if somebody could indicate who has who has a Turnitin assignment set up and it has students submissions in it. Please indicate. Somebody had told me earlier, was it me? Alright, so in the meantime, let me just um, share my screen. And you should be seeing it. Just a bit. Are you seeing it uh, now? Nobody volunteered. No, we're not seeing it yet. Nobody volunteered. 
Nobody volunteered us mm -hmm. then. Oh, Greg, you there? Yeah. Okay. All right, good. So we look at yours in a while, Greg. I'm sharing mine, but it's not. We're seeing it. We're seeing. Oh, you're seeing it? Okay. Yes, yes. Okay. Um, apparently the system is moving a little bit. Not sure why. Anyways, so, so this is what you might see here. Let me just turn editing on so you'll see what it looks like. Um, sorry. All right, so. Good, so we have it here, turn editing on. And so I'm gonna scroll down a bit so you see where the assignment was, and it's right here. So this is ready to, to address what Greg um, was asking about and what it should look like. So the page is gonna go to the um editing assignment settings page and from here good it's just it just came up and the originality report options all right so normally what so you see here and i think this is for the um detail with regard to i think whoever asks about the portuguese assignment i believe so these are the different things I was referring to. Uh, so papers, internet, pu publications, the bibliography. You want to make sure you exclude the bibliography. Because if the student has referenced it, then you don't need to go through, you don't need to count that. Exclude quoted material. I think this is with regard to the student. The, the person who asks about a project in law with regard to quoting from a treaty. So yes, exclude quoted material. Exclude uh, small matches like let's say terms or the jargon and so on i tend to leave this as zero all right you must have a value inside this so just leave it as zero um and of course you could specify if it's words or some sort of percentage and so on but this is normally what greg it looks wanted, like sorry greg wanted to exclude a certain number of words so you know like if you think of for instance the university of the west indies that's a typical right. phrase it's six words you know so a small match would be like six words or ten words. Yeah. Right? You just insert six or whatever the, 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 the small matches might be. Um, and again, like I said, it's whatever particular jargon or term in your, in your particular thing. And then you just click save and return to course. And it's just taking a while, but it'll, no. it'll come back. <laughs> <laughs> And that's what it looks like here. And let me just show you guys while we're here what um, the assignment looks like when you attach your document um, to it. In. All right. So it looks as soon as it opens up, <laughs> it looks something like this. Notice here. Um, I was just I didn't get to specify. Sorry, but what I do is highlight it, make it. You know, because it'll all come across as black, and you wouldn't know that it's a hyperlink unless you hover over it. All right, and when the student clicks here, it opens up to um, a new window, such as this document here. All right, and of course, from there, when you scroll a little further down, you're gonna see what I mean. We have no submissions here, but you're gonna see. Basically, a summary. Um, what the student's name is, title of the submission, Turnitin paper ID. You now, Turnitin paper ID is, is just a number that Turnitin will give to that particular submission or paper. All right. So let's say if you have a major query, then Turnitin will identify paper by the ID number. All right. Um, when it was submitted and whatnot, and the similarity index. Now, here's what I was saying earlier. Sometimes you will see a different color or percentage here. So you might see 10% green, 90% red. All right? 
So that's the um, and of course the inbox they have zero, so you're not gonna see any sort of um submissions or anything inside here. All right. And of course you need to download. Of course we have when you have entries, you could download the files accordingly. All right. Let me come out of the shared screen and go back to the slideshow. Any other right. questions so, in the meantime? So we, don't need, we don't need Greg to share his again, do we? Oh, Greg, Greg was going to share his? He was going to share his. I just have one question. Will Turner him be able to handle all these submissions? So there's going to be a lot of submissions in that period of time. <laughs> <laughs> That's an excellent question. Yeah, <laughs> well, we should find out, wouldn't we? <laughs> Hi, Diane. Yeah. I would actually like I to show you where you're hearing me. Yes, we are. Yes. I would actually like to show you where I don't have the option to um, to customize. So that's because that's so strange. So I can show you. Eden is asking about marking. Eden, that, that will be in the guidelines. Exams is supposed to um, give a detailed thing about the marking and how it's to be done and so on. Hello. Yes. Um, I have three yeah, questions. Um, first one is, so we have to download all these submissions, students answers, and then upload them again. Don't mm, know. I don't think have to we don't that. know how that is to be done yet. Yeah. We know that you have to ask the students to upload them. We're not sure yet what the plan is with exams for how it's going to be second mark, graded, um, all those kinds of things. And that is what exam section has to do. We can't answer those questions. We are not exams. All we're dealing with is the vessel that the students have to upload in. So, the, so we can't answer those questions about the processes the, and the procedures and regulations. Those will come in the guidelines from exam. Did they tell you all anything about the part-timers and instructors who don't have access to my learning because they didn't get any contracts yet? No, no. As far as we are aware, people have access. We, we, don't, we didn't know that there's still people who don't have access. We know so that there people don't have access because... There are part-timers instructors without... Okay, but well, we'll, I'll put that down on the list. Okay, um, third question evades me. I'll probably remember shortly. Okay. <laughs> um, Justin, um, I gave thanks, thanks, Indira. But we'll put them down and we'll, we'll send them to exam. Um, I think Greg, Greg has, has I gave hand. Greg presenter access, so he has yes. to yeah, ahead, just Greg. guide him up to how to share if he doesn't. Oh, know. okay. All right, so Greg, um, you already have the chat um, thing up. All I need you to do is to click on the middle icon, the icon in the middle there, with the arrow on it. Icon in the middle? On the bottom yeah. of the screen. On the bottom right side. On your right, so bottom right. right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So two, yeah. it's basically two icons away from, well, one icon away from the chat icon. Right, the share share application, right? Take an arrow to the right, yeah. like a mark with an arrow to the right. Share, yeah, yeah, share right. application. Yeah. Share application, okay. And then when you go to share application, yeah. you're gonna click um ap application window. Correct. Uh, right. And now make sure you it'll help if you have your the, the screen that you wanna share. If you pull that out as a separate window as as opposed to a tab that might help as well it'll yeah, show up it's open, it's open. right is okay. it so then just click, click on the window that you want to show us and then click share okay then very good nice take All it right. away so if you look at the bottom there exclude small matches mm -hmm. no limit because i'm actually in the edit mode i'm not able to edit right. that right 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 um, so by chance, referring to actually, yeah, is this something that you created and then you have to edit? You have to you, you, you wanted to go back and tweak it, correct? Right, 
Um, with Turnitin, <laughs> that is something that's problematic. What I would recommend, did you have any submissions to this already or no? Yes, there are some submissions, so I will show you. Diane was asking about that. Oh, and okay. This assignment is actually due later and, tonight. Right, and because it's something that students already started submitting to, you're not going to be able to edit okay, this that, part that I see it. No. Yeah. yeah. Right. You have to look That's at the report. You'll have to look right. at the report, and you could do it in the report, but then you have to do it yeah. with each one. All right, okay. I, I suspected that. <laughs> you all, all want to see the... um. The actual submission. Yeah, for the other, for the other people who may not have seen one with students with real submissions, just, right. not just <laughs> fake submissions. <Right. laughs> just give me a second. Sure. Just excuse me. Just can tell me what is the option to uh, to open to it and to see all the, the option the button, please. Sorry. For turn it end to to find all option. Yes, or sure now. What is button you have to press it? To show what is option in turn it in. Edit, to edit. Yeah, 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 to see, oh. yeah, to see what options, yeah, please. Okay. Because I missed that, I missed that. As soon as um, Greg is finished with this wheel. Okay. okay. Are, you, are you all seeing the screen? Yes, we are. Yes. In this right, so there are a number of students have submitted already. And we could see the yeah. report. Just point it, Justin, point it. You want me to point yeah. at, at the Turnitin report, one of them? So you see like where you have um the two percent right right there. So you have the, the, the percentage guys. So like I said earlier, you have the student's name at the left side, the assignment title, the second column, all right? And then you have the paper ID. This is not the student's ID, this is just the paper ID. All right. Then after that, you have the time of submission. Yes, ma. Yes, ma. Right? The time of submission. So, for example, in the first one, you can see it was the 3rd of May 2020, right? At 16.08. I'm assuming that's like what, four, eight minutes past four. And we see now, with the little bars, with the little color blocks here, what 12% looks like, what 2% looks like. I think a little lower down, Greg, you had one that is yellow. Yeah, there was one that was really, here it is. Right. So you have yellow, and I think if you had one with like 90 or 80% and above would be red. No, I don't have that. I think there are like four to five colors that you have. When I say, like, and turn it in. So whenever you see red or yellow, you know, it's, it's, it's those, are, those should be a little red flag there, right? Um, I think with the, let me go on that biology joke. I know there's one with a snake. Red and yellow killer fellow. But anyways, so, <laughs> but yes, this is what it looks like, guys. All right. Yeah, you, you want me to open up the actual Turnitin report? No, you go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, so please. I'll open one. You can see what it looks like. Right. Okay. Right. Right. Okay, and as, so this is just like their little um, thing, right? And you see here, guys, what the, when, so you see it's differently, it's color coded. So where you see, just click on nine, just, just scroll up a little bit, Greg. Yeah. You seen it? No, I think the page, you, right, right here. Right. So just click on that number nine. No, I think it went down again. <laughs> Right, that one, right, the under organizations. Um, yeah. Click on any one of the numbers you see, whether it's 9, 13, or 4. Right, and you see, yeah. guys, right, so you see it shows where that, so it came from a website, clearly, biodiversity-watch.com. That's the internet source. So you know purple equals internet source. And it shows you, um, it shows you exactly what part of that um, site that refers to. Right, and obviously it's the food, and so it's not—it's not even a quote per se. It's really just um, the name of an organization. All right. This is why we were saying that when you see the similarity index um, or the similarity report, which is what this is, you have to go in with a fine tooth comb and see what is really the what it comprises. If mm -hmm. you click on food, or just hover over thirteen, Greg, if you don't mind, you'll see what another what another 
thing looks like. Right, and it's loading. Right, this one is a publication, right? So you see exactly where this came from. And of course, the other one might be some other source. Greg, if you, may, if you don't mind, you see that little funnel icon on the right side? On the right column? Yeah, I think it's like on the right side, the, on the right, right column. Yeah. One, yeah. Two, three, four. Click on right, it. Right, the fourth icon. Up. Yes. Yeah, that one. Right. And this, guys, is really where you can um, set it if you realize that, you know, you, you have little minor things. And Greg, I think this is what the minors you think, where you might have to manually do it for each submission um, with regard to the words, with regard to the bibliography and that, you know, if you want to tweak for these set times. Right? Yeah. Does that help you? Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, yeah, things like that. So, for example, where we saw it was referring, it, it picked up on the name of the organization. I can't remember the name of, what was the specific name, but this is what you could um, uh, specify. All right? <laughs> so, right. So, you see, it's a new... I put um, 81 instead of 8. <laughs> Sorry. I was wondering why I saw 81. Yeah, it's it's how it comes to see what it's going to be. Right, and you see, so every time he sets it, guys, the percentage changes. So now what would have been like 12% has gone down to 10%. Correct. Right? Yeah. So that's how you do it. I think this is very uh, useful. No problem at all. No problem. So this is how you could you, you easily easy, you can easily see what and that's why we say not don't just go to percentage. You probably sometimes have to go inside and see what made up this percentage. So we saw one with fifty four percent. It might very well be that the student named or identified the organizations by name every time instead of using some sort of you know an acronym or something. So. Not just because you see 54% is like, oh gosh, you still have plagiarized. No, it, it, you have to go in and see, and it doesn't take much. You go in and you just tweak it. And then, when, of course, 10%, I think, is within the limit um, that they allow. Go ahead, and Dira. Okay. Oh, I thought Indira had a question. Okay, so thanks so much, Greg. Okay. Thanks so thanks, much. Greg. This, uh, um, before we close up, sorry. Before we close up, Justin, don't forget to just quickly show um, Radar where to get the settings again. He, he wants to see where oh, you get. Oh, Greg, could you share your screen one more time, please? He already. Not from, um, not from him, uh, Justin. It's from you, from the option, not from the. Uh, uh, not from the report. To Go to the the, the slide. Right is it the slide or the or the No, yeah, from so actual on? setting, from your screen, from your screen. Oh, okay. So you wanted to see the about setting of the Trinity. All right. Let me just go back. Oh, I could have gone right there. One sec. So we so we go here. Oh, I think it's still loading on my part. I have it up on my screen if you want. Oh, you have it up? Okay. Yeah. yeah. All right. So let me stop sharing then. And you go right ahead. Okay. So I, I have to share now, right? Yeah. All right. Just a second. Right, so it's coming up here, nice, good. So under this part, uh, Ritter, you're gonna yeah. see, I think I was going through the different settings here. Um, okay. Originality report settings. Okay, okay. Um, so like I said, you want to make sure it's, you generate reports immediately so the students can see before they click submit. All right, then you want to make sure you click no repository. 
no repository right okay. after that um these are the diff under this blue thing here these are the different settings you're going to create um so you t you're basically telling Turnitin what to check against what yeah. to check the student paper against but just one, one thing, excuse me, uh, you know, I know mm -hmm. it is Trinitarian is approved about uh, plagiarism, right? Maybe, could be yes, could be no. What about the cheating? Right. If you have to come exam, whatever, right? And the student take it taken from the notes or from the book. Uh, and, you mm -hmm. know, how can, how can, you know, uh, Trinitarian discover cheating and improve that? Especially if normal notes or whatever. If it's something like your notes or you said something from the book let's say it's from the textbook it'll pick it up from the textbook that's for sure right if it's something like um let's say a major paragraph or an entire paragraph that was taken from whatever the source is once Turnitin can pull it it will identify it but you don't right? take it if, if you if you make it from your notes or from your powerpoint and so on Right, but well, in a case like that, then it's a little more on the tricky side. So that's what I'm saying is only once it's in Turnitin, the Turnitin repository, then it will pick uh -huh. it up. Keep in mind, you could also identify, but Turnitin will pick it up as students almost like plagiarizing from each other because if they all have the same okay. thing from that particular PowerPoint, from that source, you know, chances are, especially if it's a large class, at some point in time, somebody's going to have the exact same paragraph or okay. two students will at least have the same thing. So that's one way of picking it up. And then, of course, you, you may get further details from exam section on how to deal with um, instances of suspected cheating and, and whatnot. Yes, yes, yes. Thanks so much. All right. So let me, any other questions, guys? All right. Thanks so much for that, Sorry. Greg. I just um, some, um, links in the, yeah, in the chat. Go ahead, Diane. I said I shared some links in the chat with um, separate, separate files of videos to take people through how to do the different things that we did today. So people could probably just select, copy, and paste it. But I will also send email to everybody with the slides and, and this list. Um, I yes. will send it. I will send it in an email to people using the same email that you all use to register for the workshop. Your question bank is only available for quizzes and you're not allowed to use quizzes for the final exam. I'm also posting the evaluation link, Justin. For yes, people who, so let just let them know. Guys, we have um, all of Diane just posted this, uh, the resources and so on that you could link, you could um, use. She's posted it in the chat, and of course, you're going to get an email for it uh, with it, with it sorry. and um, I think you'll also see it in the resource site along with some other things. So you might probably, yes, Aura? I just said. Hi, how are I you? I noticed that in the assignment, there is a mm -hmm. feedback option, but there's right. no feedback option in Turnitin. Can you... Right, you're not going to be given feedback um, in this context. Let me just say that one time. So I don't think you need to worry too much about the feedback option because um, because remember it's like an exam. Well, under exam conditions, you're going to be doing this 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 particular thing. So keep that in mind. You're not going to be grading or putting up your grades or giving feedback to students in this regard. All right. Right. Why we're not giving feedback to students because I understand it's an exam. Now, we have some courses where you have multiple, multiple um, lecturers going to be marking the paper. Is it mm -hmm. that the lecturer will have to mark the paper separately, or can, we, or can lecturers submit their mark on that one paper and provide feedback? I'm just concerned that exam will, will be asking for the script, or we want to see the script at some point. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so I think, Oral, what we've been saying throughout this session is we don't, we can't give you guidelines on those things because those fall within the ambit of exam regulations. We, we, we haven't been given all the information. We've shared with you yeah. what we know. But exam section has said very clearly they're going to do a comprehensive set of guidelines to address these kinds of questions. So we don't want to say anything to you and then that's not correct. Yeah. And things seem to be changing a little bit as you go along. So by the end of this week, I think you all should have those guidelines. What we've been doing is as people raise the issues in the session, we've been noting them and sending them to exam section so that they okay. could include these things in the guidelines for you. All right, that's the most we could do. But from yeah. our position, we don't know. That's the honest to goodness truth. Okay. Thank you guys. Thank you guys very much. No problem at all. And the link to this recording, um, and well, we have last week's recording too. Then I guess um, if they want to look at that, but any if you want to get the link to this recording, um, I guess we could send it to you, and it also be on the resource site. All right. And guys, feel free if you have any other questions or concerns. Feel free to shoot us an email at cetl underscore bl at sta.gwi.edu. And I think Diane might type it in the chat just now because you may not be able to see the underscore there quite clearly. So um, cetl underscore bl at sta.gwi.edu. And um, we'll definitely get back to you or try our best to, if not answer the question, at least for your concern to the necessary put, whether it be exam um, or whoever. All right. No problem at okay. all. All right. So that's it for us. And um, yeah. as I said, we'll send on the information to you in a few minutes. As soon as we come off and I organize, I will send you all the slides and the list of, res uh, list of resources. So have a good evening, everybody. All right. Thank you. Have a great evening, guys. Thank you.